Sarah Khan is the Director of Programs at the Asian Pacific Institute on Gender-Based Violence. As the Director of Programs, she oversees the coordination and administration of all aspects of government, public, and privately funded API GBV programs. Sarah's direct service experience has deeply informed how she understands and addresses challenges faced by the community she serves. After 9-11, she intentionally chose to work at the intersection of race and gender violence and justice to concretely reduce the vulnerability of immigrants, refugees, and other marginalized groups. She has a long-standing passion for grassroots activism, domestic violence advocacy, and community engagement and education and empowerment, with close to 20 years of working in the field. She has expertise in program design, development, and management, with a focus on changes to people, organizations, and systems across areas. Her passion is fueled by breaking silos and encouraging herself and others to address intersectionality in their work by addressing root causes of gender-based violence. Originally from Kashmir and settled in the San Francisco Bay Area with her family, Sarah is fluently multilingual in various South Asian languages. She has a BA in History, Honours, and MA in Political Science, and an MPhil in International Relations from New Delhi, India. Sarah envisions a world free of gender-based violence for communities with equal opportunities for all to thrive. She strongly feels it's everyone's duty to disrupt gender-based violence, which causes physical, sexual, emotional, spiritual, and economic harm. Really, really uh, amazing what you have been doing for many years for our community. And um, thank you so much for coming. I know you are a very hard person to get <laughs> because you are so busy assisting a lot of people. And <laughs> why don't we start? You know, I, I know I introduced you, but I just would like to give you the opportunity to say a little bit more about yourself and then what, you know, um, drove you into this field, this very important work that you do. Thank you so much, first of all, for having me here. I totally appreciate it. And I think we have so many people in our communities working to end all sorts of um, issues. So I moved here about 24 years ago. And um, I like, I don't know about you, but like a lot of other immigrant people that have been privileged to go to English medium schools. I think I grew up on a lot of Hollywood about what the USA is like and, you know, land of the brave and the free, which it is, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have its own issues. And um, so when I moved to the US, I came for higher studies and I realized that uh, we're not all equal in so many which ways. And the story that is being fed or that people usually follow are like, you know, if you work hard, if you keep your head straight and eyes on the prize, everything will work out for you. Well, I was lucky enough to be working along those lines in a good field. And then I started going to our local um, mosque and realized that people were coming there, women mostly were coming there asking for help. And that was very shocking where I was like, wait, here? What help? Like law and order and all had not started yet. So we didn't know all of that. I didn't know all of that. So that was very shocking to me that uh, you know, folks didn't necessarily speak the language and then needed interpretation. So that was kind of like my in into court accompaniment, like we, you know, we say in our world, like just interpreting. And then I went for training and realized that a lot of folks from my part of the world, from the from different communities, uh, are not, you know, uh, may not necessarily know how to speak the language and certainly may not know their rights, which was what led me to then when I moved to California to work in a fantastic organization, a huge start of shout out to Maitri where I was their first full-time staff. And now that organization's grown and doing great work in the Bay Area. And that was basically my introduction 
Um, I think the realization that those that are most marginalized often are not seen by the system or the community as being worthy of being helped. That's really amazing. And, um, you know, you, you said it right. And we need someone uh, to be a voice in our community and um, our voice matters. And it, it's good to have that voice. And I'm so glad you chose that path, <laughs> uh, you know, impacting so many people. Um, and we get to uh, benefit from that also, you know, and um, I could relate to your story as well when I first came. So it's really important that we be a voice for the community. So um, I want to dive in to this Absolutely. topic that I've been wanting to talk about for such a long time. And uh, since we have the expert. I want to know, like, you know, sometimes when you say something like a word and what it means could be very different. Sometimes it's lost in the language. Sometimes it's lost in the cultural context. Uh, sometimes we casually use it, you know, oh, this is this. And then, but what is really domestic violence? How would you define it? Let's start there. Yes, I'm so happy you asked for a definition. It sometimes drives people crazy when I ask for definition because my interpretation of things would be so different from yours, for example, right? So what domestic violence, and one term for it is domestic violence, uh, the legalish term for it is domestic dispute, then we also say dating violence and more in our field in the, uh, you know, working to end domestic violence, if you will. It's called intimate partner violence in the Western world. But what it really is, is a pattern of behavior used by one partner to maintain power and control over another partner, mostly in an intimate relationship. And I say that mostly because that is what intimate partner violence is. But if we bring in the cultural nuances of what I call the global majority, which is not so much the Western world, but the rest of the world, it is also of your extended family. So sometimes people would say that my partner could be husband, could be wife, could be boyfriend, girlfriend, or whoever that is not abusive, but it could be the mother-in-law, the sister-in-law. So it's not intimate in the sense of having sex with that person, but it's intimate in the sense that it's your family surrounding. So that is domestic violence in a nutshell, which is a little different from sexual violence. Sexual violence can also happen in, in, that is an act mostly by your intimate partner. But in a lot of our cultures and communities, it's not recognized because it's supposed to be a right of one person from the other, which is, again, very different, even though you didn't ask me, but I just want to separate these questions from sexual assault which is a sexual act committed against someone without that person's freely given consent. But it could be like a one-time attack versus the violence, which is mostly in an intimate partner uh, situation, which happens over time. You may not consent, but you may not necessarily know that you can say no. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> it does. And it's just... Really amazing how you put all that together and um, also that um, domestic violence does not mean uh, between partners, but also it could be, um, you know, family members as well. And that's important because as immigrants, we have uh, extended family, right? It's like a lot of people living together or, uh, uh, you know, uh, around our area so that's that's very important to mention and I think that would have slipped my mind 
if I would talk about uh, domestic violence, we always focus on that. So that's really uh, amazing. But I wanted to see when I think about, you know, my culture, for example, where I come from, um, and a lot of other cultures, um, I see that when they talk about marriage or whatever, control uh, sounds a very uh, normal thing. Mm-hmm. That a man should have a control over the woman. And um, uh, so, and it's accepted. We're going to go back to the uh, the types of, you know, uh, domestic violence. I will ask you to, to categorize which ones are. But uh, what kind of control are we talking about? How can we explain to people who who think control is part of the marriage because not a lot of people have healthy relationships and right. uh, uh, and not taught in the school. So how would we, what is, what is that control thing we're talking about that is out of the limit um, that would make it domestic violence? Does that make sense, my question? <laughs> yes, it absolutely makes sense. And I do want to say that, you know, yes, we are living here, but we all, each one of us comes with our own um, culture. And I don't mean culture just of the community or the country you belong to, but our own individual family culture. So, for example, I'm married and my husband and I are both from the same part of the same community, religion, area, generation, family background, everything. But our families, cultures, home to home are also very different, right? So to to say that I am not using completely the Western concept of consent or control or power, it all is, it all depends on your family. And then I think all societies, communities, cultures, and media kind of contribute to the abuse and normalization, but also uplift the othering, like yours or mine is wrong versus the kind of control that may happen here or to a European person, for example. So to answer your question of what control looks like, I feel like each family is different, right? In some families, it will be like, I am the breadwinner. I control the money. It could also be that I don't want to control the money uh, because you are the, you are the one who's uh, bringing in the the you know the income you can you can send it better to me control is if i am doing grocery shopping i have a budget we can work on a budget together and and that is what i work with them but if you are handing me which i'm t- giving you a, a real life scenario of one of the clients is if you're handing me $20 after I'm working and bringing in money and then asking me for change and a full-on receipt of what I spent the money on, that is a deliberate tactic of proving your power and control over a person. Just to give that as an example. Did that help or answer your question? That was actually a perfect example. Yeah, it's a small example, but perfect example how you can cross that, you know, um, unhealthy or like being showing your power. So uh, that was really, really good. And um, so now I would like to and I, I, I want to emphasize that how you said, I mean, the individual, I mean, the 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 household itself has its own culture as well which is true because we're not the same. Like my friend and I live very different lifestyles and we have different culture, even though we're from the different culture. So I love that you incorporated that so that, you know, our viewers understand it's not just, um, um, you know, cultural in a sense of country and also living in a, in the U S living with, you know, among many um, cultures is also it makes it more complicated so thank you for explaining all that and now i want to move to the types of domestic violence Mm -hmm. um how many are there 
or um, if you could also list them, that would be helpful for people to understand. Hmm. There are lots, right? And they are basically, so I usually don't even say domestic violence. And I know that I usually say gender-based violence. It's just because it's violence that is directed at an individual based on their biological sex or gender identity. And there are lots of ways in which you can coerce someone, right? So, so in terms of listing, the one that we all think of automatically is physical or sexual. Then there's verbal, which is usually put down to um, abuse. People don't say verbal violence, but verbal abuse or verbal violence is big and it's used in our families. It's used against your intimate partner. It's used against your children, against your parents. Uh, there's emotional withholding or gaslighting, this psychological abuse, there's always the threats. And then um, a big one that we see here is uh, economic or educational deprivation and immigration, right? Um, withholding green card uh, or the threat of taking children away or sending back to the home country. And these could be happening in your public or private lives. So those are some of the forms that I can think of. Yeah, I, I see the economic and immigration um, mm -hmm. part of it a lot um, at the courthouse um, when divorce is the issue. So that's very interesting. Uh, did you say verbal abuse and psychological abuse are the same or different? No, no, it's they're the not. I, um, what I meant was like, when we say verbal or emotional or psychological, we don't say violence. We say abuse, like it makes it any less, but it doesn't. It's the same. Like it's equally bad. Uh, but yeah, or threats and coercions. Like, you know, people try and tone down the language yeah. oftentimes, but it's not necessarily all of that. Perfect. And I uh, thank you. Yeah, I know. Uh, it's, it sounds sometimes very confusing when you change the words. It's like, is it the same thing or whatever? Um, but it doesn't matter. Abuse um, or violence, it, it doesn't make it easy. It's the, it's the same. And thank you for correcting me. And I'm, from now on, um, I'm an age, you know, I'm, I, I just learned about gender based violence. I'm going to say that from now on thank you and um with that i want to ask if domestic see gender-based violence is it only happening to women or does it happen for men because usually um uh, you hear it from women like men doing it to i mean to women um could you elaborate on that yes i absolutely can um, so, uh, okay, I'll come to the myths in a bit, uh, in a bit. So when we were saying that gender-based violence is directed at an individual, right? Based on their gender, reality is relationship violence, sexual assault, they are universal issues that can happen to anyone, regardless of their background, their identity, or their sexual um, orientation. They, however disproportionately impact women, girls, and the LGBT community, particularly those of color. Not to say that those in the minority that are abused, people who identify as men or, or consider themselves men, of course they are abused. Like I said, this is all about power and control, and it's about who has power and control over another person. And the reality is that a lot of us coming from, and you already spoke about this, coming from your and my communities, come from a patriarchal society. So who are the rules mostly in favor of, right? They are mostly in favor of cisgendered men. So it, while on one hand, it becomes harder for them, those that are men that are abused to report it based on the patriarchy, 
The reality also is when it comes to the hierarchy, they stand taller than women in such households, whether because they are the ones who are making the money or maybe because women end up going to someone else's house to live and start a life there. There is an inequality in a relationship to begin with. And if you are, if you are used to being in control or want to, not everyone is abusive, but those that are, are, it's easier for men to do that control. But it does not mean. It does not <laughs> it mean. It only, yeah. So um, mostly, you know, it's also biased in our, in our mind because it's the majority. Uh, we all, like, I can also include myself in that. Like whenever I hear gender-based violence, I always think it's a man doing it to a woman or right. uh, so it's a but it's a bias in it our is. understanding. Um, but it could happen that um uh, any other way, like it could it could happen to a woman um doing it to a man or um in the LGB community or any anybody right or family members um and i i've heard i think uh, in uh, the culture that i come from there's also a very famous um uh, uh thing that goes on between uh, a daughter-in-law and her yeah you know her mother-in-law so that could also count like um you know uh, gender-based violence as well right Yes, it, it's actually patriarchy at power, right? At its best. So you spoke about your community. I can talk about, um, I think, again, the inbred thing of my my mom, for example, like my grandmother was fantastic with us and I'm sure she was fantastic with everybody else. Also, all the grandkids and her sons, etc. But I'm not sure how good she was with her daughters-in-law but that's because she didn't know any other way right and so sometimes if my mom would say something to my brother's wife and I'd be like that's not what you would tell your daughter right it's up to us to educate but that's what they know that's what they've learned to them we we went through all of that whatever they went through hopefully nothing too bad but now it's our turn to shine when else right it's like it's our turn to to put this power on top of someone else so i feel like those are conversations that needs to happen and oftentimes like you know uh, i don't know about your culture but in my community there's also a saying which is like a oh, woman is always a woman's worst enemy and I get so angry about that because it has nothing to do with women versus another woman, but it's more about how patriarchy kind of sets it up that way. Just like all people of color end up fighting with each other and then white supremacy is up there, right? So, exactly. yeah. so It's incredible. It's like, uh, I, I have to win for you to, I have, uh, for, in order for me to win, you have to lose mentality. Like we are right. all different and we can all win. There's no such thing. And we are trying to push through that. And um, I, I love that, you know, educating ourselves first, you know, women and taking that power and educating others uh, is very key. And um, it's interesting. You mentioned that you know that's what they know like it's our responsibility to teach and um i think i have mentioned this in my email a uh, long time ago and I, I i wrote this in my um book as well one of the things that i see in the courthouse is uh people who come from uh, couples who come from my culture quickly find out that uh physical violence is uh you know, it's a big uh uh <laughs> here in the US. Although it's accepted, you know, in the culture that we came from. And I used to, growing up, I, I remember getting very upset <laughs> about this. Like, you know, it's common sense. Why are you hitting this woman? Or I, I would get in a fight or something like that, and nobody would do anything about it. And then the girls also feel like, it's okay, 
Yeah. Like even if you try to rescue them or speak on on her on on that on their behalf, they would say, "Hey, don't you know? Don't meddle. You know, he loves me." Or they see it as a sign of love. So they quickly discover after coming here, um, you know, that the the law itself educates them. <laughs> you know, although. Uh, I'm sorry to say they have they have to come to the courthouse to find out. And usually they have like this scared look, like they're shocked. What? I mean, I love my wife. I just, you know, I just slapped her a little bit. <laughs> She's my wife, you know, and it's it's interesting. And I know that physical and um, sexual violence uh, will take care of it when people come here. If that happens, I mean, I hope the community educates them, preparing them before they get to the um, the courthouse. But this these are big things that happen, like you can see, and um, can be resolved, right? But when we go to the other ones, like psychological abuse, and then, you know, uh, and I want to talk about also the economical and immigration, but um, especially the psychological abuse that becomes very, very difficult um, to educate or even for the person who's abused to kind of see and say, hey, I'm being abused. Maybe I should do something about it. So how can one tell um, that you know, that's happening in their marriage. Could you maybe give us a few examples? I know it's a broad uh, topic, but could you give us a few examples from your experience maybe? Yes, I can. Um, so this is the piece where we call like myths versus facts, if you will. So like one of the big myths that we have is that violence is caused by stress alcohol, drugs, mental illness, or economic security. We saw that all through COVID. People started losing their jobs and the rates of reporting violence went up, right? Or that this happens when a partner loses control and it can be solved by anger management. And then the other piece about the shame of it's a private issue. It's between, between the husband and wife. Nobody wants to interfere. Till then, everybody is talking about everything that is happening in your family. But in this case, there is silence, right? So all of these can be factors, but these are not the causes. So one example, like some, so, so the biggest thing is outreach and education and just holding conversations. I, I feel like a big piece of it is um, if you believe in uh, if you have faith, if you are the, you're part of a religious community, it's a big piece of your faith leaders to preach, to like give sermons about this. And I always use one example. And my example is, if you are so stressed, right? If you are so stressed because you lost your job or your job is very hard or your boss is, is being very you know, un unreasonable or whatever your stress is, your father is sick in another country and um, any such thing, will this anger, whether it's emotional or physical or financial, come out on your boss or come out on whoever else other than your intimate partner? If it is, then you're stressed and you need help. But that is my big piece. Like, why is this, why is this stress coming out on the one person who is there supporting you, right? So I don't know if I answered your question. 